Hello, my name is Olivia swedberg dinger and I direct the music therapy program at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, Kentucky, USA. My colleagues and I are excited to share with you some information about centering perspectives of disabled children in music education research. Before we begin, I wanted to note that throughout this presentation, we will use identity first language rather than person first language when referring to disabled children. However, we acknowledge that there is not universal agreement, even within the community of disability advocates, regarding language used to describe disability, and that many music educators and music therapists may be more familiar and comfortable with the use of person first language. We will share resources at the end of the presentation for those who wish to learn more about identity first and person first language, as well as their connections to various models of disability. Before I introduce my co-presenters, I want to share with you an acknowledgement of land and labor. We respectfully acknowledge that the University of Kentucky sits on the traditional territory of the Osage, Shawnee, and Cherokee peoples, and was initially funded through the expropriation of indigenous land. Furthermore, we honor the many contributions of African Americans whose often unacknowledged and unpaid labor helped make the University of Kentucky Lexington and the Commonwealth of Kentucky what they are today. Now, I would like to introduce my co-presenters from whom you will hear later. Dr. Martina Vassell is Associate Professor and Division Coordinator of Music Education at the University of Kentucky. Elena Stroud is a board certified music therapist and music therapy graduate assistant at the University of Kentucky. The seed for the idea for this paper came from a previous study that Martina and I conducted. In summer 2019, we partnered with the University of Kentucky's Human Development Institute to offer a week-long inclusive summer music day camp for children with and without disabilities. While reviewing literature for this earlier study, we came across a quote from a paper that Judith Jellison and Donald Taylor published in 2007 that really stuck with us. The paper was a review of inclusive music research from 1975 to 2005. And the quote says, absent from all studies were direct measures of the attitudes of children or adults with disabilities. In looking at the music education research since then, we could only find seven studies in which researchers asked children with disabilities what their perspectives were on music experiences. So we felt that this was really important to consider given the lack of research in this area. So in designing our summer music camp, we took steps to find out what the children liked and didn't like about the camp. We built in opportunities for free play and socialization in between more structured group activities. During the final play break each day, we asked the children if they wanted to draw or write about what they liked about music each day. We used those drawings in addition to a focus group interview with children and their parents at the end of the camp to identify themes that emerged regarding children's and parents' perceptions of the camp. These are some of the drawings by one of the participants. We let them choose their own pseudonyms and this participant chose the name the spider. So on day one, the spider drew a picture that he captioned the carpet and we are flying in the air. And on day two, he wrote and drew, I got to play mouse and cat and listen to two books and a story. So we were inspired by the uh, creativity that children uh, were able to use to demonstrate what they liked and didn't like. We realized that we needed to be creative as well. So learning about the children's perspectives of the camp was not without its challenges, but we felt that what we learned made the effort worthwhile. This quote from a participant in a study led by Daphne Rickson essentially sums up how we felt. This is a young person who served as a co-researcher in this project who said, research makes me feel tired, but I think it's important to know about music. And Elena, will share with you that she actually put a quote, this quote on her computer <laughs> as a reminder, I think it's helpful for all of us that even though our research makes us tired, it's important. So some of the challenges of 
um, examining perspectives of disabled children include it's not easy and it takes additional time. Uh, but some of the benefits are that it's essential for improving inclusion. It's important because it's a part of respecting children's rights and it's a way to empower children. And as we were writing up the results, we were really inspired by what Daphne Rickson wrote about centering perspectives of children with disabilities in music therapy research. We decided we wanted to learn more about ways to do this in music education research. When thinking about the rights of children, we were further inspired by the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And we use these articles in particular to guide our work as they have for many researchers internationally since they were first articulated in 1989. As a side note, there's a children's version of the UNCRC that's very accessible and easy to read. When Olivia's nine-year-old decided he wanted to write a four paragraph essay to their local school advocating for more equitable dress code and behavior management policies, they had read the children's version as a bedtime story so he could draw from it to support his arguments. This made Olivia think about how she could present information in ways that are more accessible, not just for children, but also for adults. Thanks, Martina. I love that story, which of course was shared with my son's permission. Several articles from the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child that inspired us are identified here. Article three relates to the best interests of the child and states, when adults make key decisions, they should think about how their choices will affect children. All adults should do what is best for children. Article 12 relates to showing respect for children's views and states that children have the right to give their opinions freely on issues that affect them. Adults should listen and take children seriously. Article 13 relates to sharing thoughts freely and states that children have the right to share freely with others what they learn, think, and feel by talking, drawing, writing, or in any other way unless it harms people. Article 23 specifically focuses on children with disabilities, stating that every child with a disability should enjoy the best possible life in society. Governments should remove all obstacles for children with disabilities to become independent and to participate actively in the community. Article 29 relates to the aims of education and states that children's education should help them fully develop their personalities, talents, and abilities. It should teach them to understand their own rights and to respect other people's rights, cultures, and differences. Finally, Article 31 relates to rest, play, culture, and arts, and states that every child has the right to rest, relax, play, and take part in cultural and creative activities. Using these articles as a conceptual foundation, we assert that all children, including disabled children, have a right to music education, to A, help them understand their culture and that of others, and B, empower them to take part in important cultural and creative activities. Furthermore, we believe that music educators should be proactive in removing obstacles that prevent disabled children from participating fully in music communities. So we'll share with you what some of those obstacles are in terms of conducting research with children, and then we'll also share with you some strategies for helping remove obstacles to centering perspectives of disabled children in music education research. Sometimes ethical tensions create an obstacle to centering perspectives of disabled children in music education research. Several scholars have noted ethical tensions that are important to consider when conducting research with disabled children particularly those related to the conflict that adults face between protecting children and honoring their participation rights. Researchers have highlighted ethical tensions related to power dynamics, consent, and obtaining permission to observe, responsibility for children's well-being, representativeness of participants, impact of participation, considering children's spaces as sites for research, the interpretive framework used in data analysis, and including children in the decision to share results with other people. In addition to ethical concerns, as we mentioned earlier, researchers often overlook the perspectives of disabled children because including disabled children in research takes time and is not always easy. However, we believe that the benefits of listening to children outweigh the challenges. 
While acknowledging that challenges and barriers exist, including disabled children in research, we now turn our attention to solutions and resources, namely participatory research and the mosaic approach. Participatory research is conducted as a collaboration between people who are affected by an issue. They are interested in generating change and they may or may not have research training. Each of the stages of the research process can serve as choice points for the degree of stakeholder participation. Daphne Rickson offered one suggestion, which was to engage in participatory research with disabled children rather than conducting research on disabled children. Sometimes engaging disabled children in research requires creative communication strategies, as summed up here by Mikey. Mikey's a 14 year old with dyspraxia. Here's what Mikey had to say. If you are lucky enough to meet someone with verbal dyspraxia, please just remember that their inability to speak is no reflection on their intelligence. We know so much more than we can prove in the spoken word, and some, like me, might struggle to get it on paper. Be resourceful and help us to open our minds and find a way to help us prove our intelligence. Think outside the box and don't give up on us. This quote was a reminder that drawings can be a creative form of communication for children. Martina is now going to tell you more about a research approach that uses drawings as one of several flexible, creative forms of gathering information about children's perspectives. In a previous study, I had used children's drawings as a form of data, and this is a part of an approach called the mosaic approach. With the mosaic approach, elements of traditional qualitative research are combined with participatory research, and it's grounded in four assumptions about children. One is that children are experts in their own lives. Two, children are skillful communicators. Three, children are rights holders. And four, children are meaning makers. The flexibility and multimodality of the mosaic approach has made it a successful tool in research with disabled children. In order to allow children to share their thoughts freely, in the mosaic approach, researchers use flexible, multimodal forms of gathering information from children. This graphic shows what occurs in the three stages of the mosaic approach, gathering children's and adults' perspectives, discussing the material, and deciding areas of continuity and change. The orange squares in the second and third rows of this mosaic are some ideas of ways that disabled children might share their perspectives. In addition to forms of gathering information used by researchers in early childhood and elementary education, such as using photographs and photo books made by children, role playing through acting or with puppets, child led tours and map making, and children's drawings or block trees. We have added musical forms of gathering information used in research with disabled children, namely recordings of transcriptions or improvisation or compositions. After gathering information about children's and adults' perspectives using multiple flexible methods, the researchers review and discuss the material they collected with the stakeholders, allowing children, parents, siblings, teachers, and or peers to help put together the mosaic of information gathered. Finally, the researchers and stakeholders engage in the evaluation stage together, making decisions about what changes they might make. We are really excited to engage in research using the mosaic approach with disabled children and look forward to sharing what we learn. So before we wrap up, I wanted to share with you some information for those of you who are interested to learn more, to read some of the research that inspired us. As I promised at the beginning, here are some articles on disability language. And feel free to pause this video, take pictures of the screen, take notes. Here are some articles on Reviews of Music Education Research with Disabled Children, uh, the Jellison and Taylor article from 2007 that inspired us initially, as well as a more recent uh, review of music education research. 
here are the seven studies that we found in which researchers included perspectives of children, uh, of disabled children in music education research. Here are some authors and articles in which authors discussed ethical tensions in research with disabled children and also ways that they were able to resolve some of those tensions. Here are several articles on participatory research in general, in music education, and in music therapy. Finally, here are some articles and books featuring the use of creative approaches to research with children, uh, particularly the mosaic approach, but also some other creative approaches, not formally um, not using all of the elements of the mosaic approach, but still using some flexible methods that would be appropriate for using with disabled children. Finally, since we've been talking about centering perspectives of children, I thought it would be appropriate to leave you with some words of wisdom and pictures from my children. So when I asked them, how do you feel when adults listen to you? This is what they drew. Pictures of them feeling happy, glad, and glorious. They also said, when I asked, what advice do you have for adults trying to listen to children? They said, try not to be mean to kids, be patient. When I asked, how do you feel when adults do not listen to you? They drew pictures of them feeling sad, annoyed, anxious, scared, mad. This one says, I am scared and upset. And this is a picture of anxious. Their final words of wisdom that I'll leave you with, never be too busy, be kind. Thank you so much for attending our presentation. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your commission.